Well, good morning again. It is so great to be with you all. Let's, um, while the team is still in here, let's say thank you to the team, the worship team. I, I know each one of them would say, you know what, it's all for God's glory. That's why I want to thank them. That's why I want to say thank you. Thank you for leading us to the throne of God and, and, and leading us in worship. And they do a marvelous job, and so I'm so thankful for them. So if you want, and I would love it if you would join us, open up your Bibles to Ephesians. So Pastor Mike covered for me the last three weeks, so I'm going to try and do my best to knock off the rust and see what happens. But I really appreciate Pastor Mike, too, and he's, he's uh, getting away with his wife right now, so, you know, just thank him for the covering the last three weeks. It was my birthday, my anniversary, and then we had the wedding uh, conference, and so he's like, yeah, let me just cover all of those for you, Richard. And so I said, all right, I'll let you do it. Thank you very much. So we are in Ephesians 6, the last section of Ephesians. I hope you guys have enjoyed Ephesians. I've loved the book of Ephesians. I, I still love it. And, and I pray that through the book, you've seen a greater glimpse of who God is, what he's doing, and how what he has done, and how now we are supposed to move forward. And so I'm calling this message, Wrap It Up. We've been in this book now for, what, 21 weeks, and six chapters long. And so it's been amazing to walk through it in the time frame that we have. We could have spent even more, but we figured, you know what? There's more books of the Bible we want to cover uh, before Jesus comes back, so let's get on with it. <laughs> so here we are in Ephesians 6 and starting at verse 21, but I'm going to go ahead and pray. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you that you reveal yourself to us through your word. And I pray, Lord, as we, as a family, begin to dissect your word and continue, excuse me, continue to dissect your word, that you would continue to show us more and more of who you are and your character. And Lord, then that we, as your children, will walk in obedience, walk in faithfulness to your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. So Ephesians 6, 21, let's go ahead and start. So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. And then here we go. One of these Bible names again. If you guys are in, us, in the reading plan with us in, in uh, first and second, well, actually we're in first Chronicles. You see all those Bible names. And how many of you guys struggle with Bible names? Those are going to be honest to raise your hand and struggle. I just want to start calling them Bill and Larry and Ted or just simple names, you know. But God had a purpose for naming them. And now here we come to one. I don't know if you guys know, but I'm sure you've noticed. Phonics is not my strong suit. Um, you know, that hook on, hooks on, what, I can't even say it right now hooked on phonics. That was not good for me. That was actually my first failing grade I've ever gotten in all of my, I think it's my only one. I think so. We'll just say that, um, <laughs> that I ever got in school. So phonics is not great for me. So when I look at these, it was funny because um, my kids, when they were young, and they would know, I would go to Heather and I'd say, okay, how do you say this? Or how do you spell this? Or whatever. And she goes, the kids would always look at me and they would say, well, dad, just sound it out. I'm like, I can't sound it out. I flunked phonics. It doesn't work. So I'm going to ask all of us, we're going to put this guy's name up on the screen. I'm going to ask all of you to help me pronounce his name. Who's ready to go? Okay, ready? How do you say it? T -k -k -s. T -k -k -s. You guys got that? So say it nice and loud like you really know what you're saying. Ready? Tychicus, right? That's the guy's name. So let's get going. Keep going. Tychicus, the beloved brother, or if we want to call him Ty for short, <laughs> beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose. Two reasons. Look, listen to these two reasons. 
that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. So who is Ty? Who is that guy? Who is Tychicus? I don't know. He's mentioned five times in Scripture. We can see in the text right here, it describes him. It gives him two characteristics. Or It says a beloved brother and a faithful minister. But for those that don't know, he was actually uh, joined Paul on his third missionary journey. He went with them. Now, if you know anything about Paul's min- missionary journeys, they usually weren't smooth sailing. You know, that's something we usually pray before we send somebody out. Lord, I pray that their, their, the road before them will be smooth, that you will handle all these situations. They'll get the right connecting flights, and they'll, you know, all the, they won't have any problems at customs. You guys have heard those prayers, right, for missionaries that are going out. Maybe you've had those prayed over you. Well, that wouldn't have worked for Paul and his team. Lord, I pray that they will not get shipwrecked. They got shipwrecked. Lord, I pray that they would not be persecuted. They got stoned. Rocks thrown at them. In our current culture, we have to find. They had all these hardships that were taking place, but we see Tychicus, or Ty for short, was with him. He was a faithful brother that stayed with him. He was a faithful minister. We can also see in other passages, and in this passage as well, that Paul was sending him to Ephesus. Who was teaching in Ephesus? Do you guys know? Timothy. Timothy was teaching in Ephesus. So when Paul would send Ty to Ephesus... He was so that Timothy can come back and be with Paul. So he, we knew he was an interim pastor, that he would fill in. He did the same thing for Titus. He was a friend. And we see three things here about Tychicus, or Ty, if you want to call him that. But now we know how to say his name, right? Well, some of us do. (laughs) Tychicus, right? So we see three things, and if you want to pull out your bulletin, you can. The first thing we see that he was invested. Tychicus was invested. He was invested in the ministry. I just described what Paul's journey was like on his missionary journeys, and yet Tychicus stayed with him the whole time. I don't know about you, but when things get tough and sometimes it's challenging to stay there, I might have said, hey, Paul, you know what? Good luck, brother. I'll pray for you from over here, where it's nice and comfortable, where I know I'll have power, I'll have food, I'll have whatever, but I'm praying for you. But Tychicus, no, he stayed with him. He was a faithful brother, a beloved brother, so he was invested. I want to ask you today, how invested are you? How invested are you in God's mission for your life? How invested are you? When God calls you, and we, we have all said, well, I think God is really calling me to do this, or I feel God has really placed this on my heart. When things get hard, do we want to throw in the towel? When things get difficult, do I want to just throw my hands up and say, okay, forget it? You guys have heard some of my story. There's been times, unfortunately, in my life where I said, God, I know you called me to this, but this does not, this is not pleasurable. This is not fun. I've even said this phrase, and if you guys want to talk to me in between the family room, talk to me. But I said, God, if this is the God, if this is how you're going to treat me as God, then I don't know if I want to serve you. With everything in my life falling apart, and I've still held on to barely a thin, a thin thread of hope saying, God, I know you're faithful. Are you invested? Are you one that says, you know what? I have skin in the game. I want to be here. When you think of invest, what do you think of? You think of the 
stock market. People that put money into the stock market. Why? They have skin in the game. And what do they typically do when they invest in the stock market? They watch it all the time. I had a friend that, well, he wasn't my friend. I shouldn't say that. I painted for a guy that was really wealthy, so I, he probably wouldn't call me his friend either. But I remember painting this guy's house, and his, his family, his mother and dad, had left him a lot of inve- investments in the stock market. So he would wake up in the morning and then just go into his office in his house and watch the stock market all day and move things and change things and do this and do that. Why? Because he was invested. How many of us are invested in the person that's sitting next to us? How many of us are invested in the person three rows behind us? God has brought us together as a what? Family. A family of faith. That that's what we really are. If we are truly, as Parkside's mission statement is, says, a family of faith, how invested am I in this family? Because it's going to show when things get really, really busy and we don't see each other for a little while, we're going to know what's your, where your investment is at. And listen, I'm not trying to calm, um, come down on anybody. I get it. Life is full. Life is busy. But when we set priorities, we usually what? We stick to those when we set them as a priority. How many of you guys, a show of hands, maybe some of you don't want to raise their hand, but showered this morning? How many of you guys wish the person next to you showered this morning? No, 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 I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But why did you shower this morning? You thought it's important. Or why did you shower last night? Because you're like, I don't want to show up stinky. I, don't, I know the people next to me are going to sit next to me, and they're hopefully invested in me. And I don't want them to turn away from me. It's the same way. Are we invested? Do we, we see here in Tychicus, again, a, a man that was invested. He stuck with the Apostle Paul so much so that, that it is said that Paul was in what during this time? Prison. Paul was in prison. Prisoners did not have a lot of rights, obviously. But what they could keep with them was a slave. A prisoner could keep a slave. So now what they're saying is that Tychicus probably gave up all his rights to be the Apostle Paul's slave so that he could journey with him. How many of us, including, I'm saying us, how many of us are that invested that we would say, I'm, you know what, I'm going to give up all these things that I think are my comforts my God-given rights, and all these things to be invested in a bigger picture of what God is doing, of what God is calling us to do as a family of faith. So he was invested. The next thing he was, he was informed. He says that, I, that I'm going to send him, the Lord will tell you, and he will tell you what? Everything. He was informed. How many of us are informed about what's going on with the person next to us? How many of us are invested in the person three rows behind us or informed about what's going on with them? Again, if we're a family of faith, we need to be what? Informed. We need to be invested and we need to be informed. What's going on? We said a few weeks back, I think Aaron is the one that said, or maybe Pastor Mike, when, when um, sickness has started to spike again, we said, hey, if you are in need, let the church know because we have stuff that we want to give you. We want to walk us alongside of you. How many people you think called the church? Zero. How many people you think were probably sick? A lot. Listen. The Apostle Paul is finishing a beautiful letter to the church in Ephesus. He's talking about how God has brought them together as one. 
And he's saying, I'm sending you a brother to let you know how I am doing. But Paul also wants to what? Know how they're doing. When we are invested and informed, it sharpens our prayer life for other people. Think about that. Who here wants somebody to pray specifically for the things they're going for through? I do. I want somebody to know exactly what I'm going through. So then you know what? Ask me exactly what I'm going through. I'll tell you exactly what I'm going through. I want us to be, don't do it now. <laughs> I saw somebody go, yeah, like that. Not now. We'll talk in the family room. But I want us to be a family that is invested with one another, a family that's informed. I get it that sometimes it's humbling to inform others how we're doing. I remember this one Christmas, and um, later this afternoon, actually, uh, two of our daughters will be here with their kids. Well, only one of them has kids, three kids. They're, they're visiting us from um, out of town. And I remember one Christmas, we had just moved to a new location. Money was really, really tight. Um, I was struggling to get work and that kind of thing. And I remember Christmas was coming up. And... I, Heather and I were praying, and we're like, I don't, I don't know how we're going to buy the kids Christmas gifts. I, I, don't, I don't know how we're going to do it. Now, you guys seen that meme where they have all those boats parked in the harbor, and they're saying, we don't know if Christmas is going to happen this year because all the boats are parked in the harbor. We can't get supplies. Anybody seen that? Yeah. Okay, if you think that's the real meaning of Christmas, you're wrong. But So it wasn't the real meaning of Christmas that we gave our kids gifts, but, you know, they, they were expecting some. And so... We didn't know what we were going to do. Well, the church that we were attending at that time, and we, we were just attending. I didn't go to the church. I, um, I didn't work on staff at the church. But they had this program where if somebody was struggling in the church, they could come to one of the elders and tell them what they were struggling with. And so I told Heather, I said, let's do it. Let's go tell them. And you guys, they blessed our family so much. Each one of our kids had multiple presents, and we have four. Heather and I even got presents, which I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they even told us, like, what do you want? And so I, I said, I want some sweatpants, so I got sweatpants. Why? Because they were invested, and I informed them of what was going on. Here we see Tychicus saying, Paul sending Tychicus and saying, I'm, I'm sending him so that you may know how we are doing. He all, but listen to what he says right here. Look at the first part. So that you also may know. Somehow Paul knows what they're doing, what, what's going on with them. And I'm telling you, God has brought us together as a family to walk life together. I don't want to walk life alone. And I, I don't, I could assume most of us in here don't want to walk life alone. But sometimes we have to, as, as followers of Christ, humble ourselves and say, this is what I'm going through. Can you help me in this need? We might not be able to help every need, but I know this we can at least give it a chance if we know the need. The great American theologian, Bill Withers, wrote an amazing song, Lean On, Lean On Me. You guys know that song, right? He wasn't a theologian, I'm joking. But he says a line in there that's important. He says, No one, for the, no one can fill those of your needs that you won't let known. So many of us say, you know what? I'm hurt by my church because they don't call me. I'm hurt by my church because they don't know what I'm going through. But have you informed the church? Have you let the church know? Because if you trust me, the pastor staff, the elders, let us know. We want to walk life together. 
We have prayed for people in the family room that have said, hey, I need the elders to pray for me, and we've prayed for people out there. We'll do the same thing for you guys. Let us know what's going on. There's one more thing that we see in Tychicus in this section, and then it says that he sent them for two purposes. One was so that they would know what's going on, and then he sent them another, another purpose was that they may, he may encourage your heart. How well are we doing at being an encourager? Life is challenging, right? All you have to do is watch the news and recognize life is challenging for everybody. Does that lead you to want to encourage somebody? Or does that lead you to say, man, life is hard. Let's go find somebody and let's just all complain about life together. Because typically that's what happens. Typically we'll get together and I'm like, I can't believe what's going on in the news. Can you believe this is happening and this is happening and this is happening? I want to challenge you. Double dog dare you. Is there something bigger than that? I don't know. To when you see something that can be disheartening, look for a way that you can encourage somebody through it. Look for a way that you can speak positivity into it. Now, again, don't take that and say, okay, Richard's a name it, claim it. I'm nowhere near that. But you know what they say when people are struggling with health? A lot of times, what affects if they get better or not is their what? Attitude towards it. There's something to that. And I'm not going to go around and say, start naming and claiming everything good, and Lord, I need that Mercedes, and so then I'll, no. Lord, I need that whatever it may be. But if we're walking around as negative Nancys all the time, that just brings everybody down. Are we not supposed to be, as, as this book says, as, especially even Ephesians, as Ephesians says, are we not supposed to be people that should be encouraged? A God that looked down at us and saw us in our mess, in our sin, and said, I choose you. I predestined to adopt you in love. Who should be more encouraged? Followers of Christ should be so excited about what God has done. When we look at the news, I get it that it can be discouraging, but how can we have encouragement in that? We recognize and know that what? God is faithful and he is sovereign. He knows what's going on. He hasn't left us. There's, there's a, um, a group of people, they call themselves deists. Deis, deism has been around for a long, long time. Deism, basic, the basic fundamental principle of deism is that God created everything. We can't deny that there was a creator. But then once he got everything in motion, he stepped back. To me, that is so false. God promises to never leave us or forsake us. God promises to walk every step of this life with us. We should be encouraged that God is faithful. Amen? Amen. We have to look different than the world. I'm challenging you. Seriously, be an encourager. Be an encourager. When somebody starts bringing up something negative, obviously don't whitewash it and don't fake. I, I've, you guys have heard me say, I can't stand it when people give me those Christian just uh, platitudes. I don't like it. So listen, but then leave them with encouragement. Leave them with something to hold on to of how God is faithful. So last week at the end of Pastor Mike's message, in the, in the text it says, to be praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to keep alert with all perseverance, making supplications for all saints. All saints. Not just the saints that look like me. Not just the saints that dress like me. Which some of you can't dress like me today. Some people have been talking to me. That's the only reason I'm bringing it up. This shirt actually is from the Yucatan. Um, which my son-in-law is from the Yucatan that will be here later today, so I figured I'll wear the shirt. But anyways, 
Pray for all saints, not just those that we agree with, not just those that voted just like we did, but pray for all saints. I want to give you guys some encouragement today. Because sometimes we think, well, is God really doing something? What's going on? The OCC packing party that we had, I think it was two weeks ago now, maybe three weeks ago. Do you know how many boxes they packed? Over 200 boxes they packed. You know how many boxes we collected? Total? Over 500. By the the end of this week, it'll be like 550 boxes. You guys, God is doing something. God is working in and through you guys. So I want to encourage you, keep doing stuff. Keep being invested and informed about what's going on here and in ways that you can jump in. We had a marriage conference with over 20, no, over 40 people. So that is 20 couples. Over 20 couples were here. And that was people investing in their marriage. Let's keep encouraging one another, walking alongside each other. But now let's look at Paul's prayer as he closes the book of Ephesians. Look at it in verse 23 and 24. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. So Paul prays four things for them. Prays for peace. Could we use some peace today in our culture? But see, I think we think of peace as not having conflict. If that's the case, will we ever experience peace this side of eternity? Probably not. Peace is knowing that what? God is faithful and that God is sovereign. So I'm going to have peace in the midst of my storm. In the midst of my storm, I'm going to have peace. But let's just even, I want to point back to a few verses in the text that Paul, when Paul is talking about peace, look at what he says in chapter 2, verse 14. When Paul is talking about and praying for peace, look at what he says. It says, for he himself, talking about Jesus Christ, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that, we, that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two So making peace. He mentions peace two times here in this text. One, he says, he himself is our peace. So he's our peace with God. He's brought us in the right standing with God. Then it talks about making peace with the brethren, making us one. Are you at peace with God? Are you at peace with your fellow man? And if not, what is God calling you to do? The next thing he prays about is love. Now, love can be such a confusing word today. Everybody says, no, that is love. And we'll, tell, we'll use the word like this. Well, I love my wife. And everybody says, well, amen, you should love your wife. And then I'll say, well, I love enchiladas. <laughs> is that the same thing? No right? But what is love? What is love according to the Apostle Paul here in the book of Ephesians? Flip over to chapter 1. Look at the end of verse 4. It says, in love, and then chapter, I mean, verse 5 starts. It says, in love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. What is love? 
according to the Apostle Paul, God is in his love adopted us. He redeemed us. He forgave us. That is love. If we are holding unforgiveness to somebody, we're not walking in love. Now, I get that even when I throw that phrase out. Some people are like, well, Richard, you don't know what they did. And you guys have heard me say this before. I don't know what they did. But let's trust God and, because God knows what they did. And we need to walk in forgiveness. It doesn't mean the relationship will be exactly the same. We need boundaries. But if you're holding unforgiveness, you're not walking in love. If you're not loving as Christ loved us, you're not walking in love. And the next thing he prays, he says, and love with faith. It says in Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith leads to our salvation. It's part of our salvation. It says that in 3.2, it says, Christ may dwell in your hearts with faith. It's faith leads to our the presence of Christ with us. We know that we can have faith because Christ is present in every circumstance that I walk through. And last week, Pastor Mike talked on the shield of faith. To me, faith is also our protection. You stand behind a shield for protection, and Christ is our protection. And listen to what else it says. It says, Faith, excuse me, love and faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Where does our peace, where does our love, and where does our faith come from? God. If you're seeking those things outside of God, you will not find them. Look to God for your peace, for love, the ultimate example of love and to faith. But he doesn't end there. He prays four things, as I said earlier. He prays, grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. The word grace in just the book of Ephesians is used 13 times. Do you think the Apostle Paul and God were trying to make a point? A lot of times it's talking about his grace. I'm telling you, if you haven't experienced God's grace in your life, don't leave here today without talking to somebody about it. If you haven't experienced God's peace, God's love, God's faith for you, and his grace, don't leave here today without talking to somebody. That's what the Apostle Paul's prayer is for this church in Ephesus. And I'm telling you, it's the same church that should be, I mean, excuse me, it's the same prayer that should be for the church today. That we should be walking in peace. We should be walking in love. We should be walking with faith. And we recognize and stand on God's grace for us. When Satan comes to tell us, you're not worthy, we trust in God's grace. Because in reality, you're not worthy. I'm not worthy. If it wasn't for God's grace, none of us would be saved. Amen? Amen. Not one of us can stand up on our own merit and say, well, yeah, I deserve to be saved. I was a good person. No, you weren't. Get that lie out of your head right now. Gone. We trust in God's grace. We trust in his perfect sacrifice in his son, Jesus Christ. How many of us, I want to ask you a question, how many of us want to walk in spiritual victory? I don't think it's an accident that the Apostle Paul puts this prayer after recognizing that we're in a spiritual battle. We're in a spiritual battle, yes? Yes. How do we do it? 
We stand firm. Pastor Mike did a great job last week, so I'm not going to do that message again. But what follows that is a prayer for peace, love, faith, and grace. When we walk in those, we will walk victoriously as followers of Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much again for who you are. I thank you that we can trust in a God that is faithful, a God that is true. I thank you for our time that we have spent together in the book of Ephesians. I thank you for the richness of the book. Lord, may our times together through it not return void. May we walk as children of yours, recognizing that you have chosen us, that you have adopted us, that you have made us alive. And Lord, it was all by your grace and the blood of Jesus Christ. And now, Lord, you are calling us to walk differently, to be invested, to be informed, to be encouragers. I pray that our church would be known as a place that we're invested in each other's lives, that we are informed about each other's lives, and that a place that we can get and give encouragement. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand as we close our service.